Uh, first, okay, like you are brilliant, right? And Thank you. you. <laughs> no. And you are so prolific. I mean, you don't just stop. You're like, no, you're just like, I've, I've got all my staff writing job and I'm just going to do this and just work my way up, which is great, right? Like, you know, a lot of people go do that. But you're creating stuff on top of it. You've got your Twitter account going. you got everything. Your brain never shuts off. Right, <laughs> pretty Very much. embarrassed. Yeah, <laughs> but so, so I mean, where? What do you do? Like, uh, it's a mental curse, <laughs> and I uh, do work a lot, and I think I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown in like three years, and I'm just gonna push Plan forward for until it. then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of people who are TV writers in LA also have like side stuff that they're doing. A lot of people do stand up. I don't really do stand up, but I um, really like to perform. Clearly I made I made this very stupid series if you're not familiar with it, which you shouldn't be. It's a waste of your time. You no, you um, have to watch that it. That literally I did make it to try to win a web series Emmy, which is a very recent thing that they started doing. Um, but But it was very fun aside from my quest to win a trophy. So it was, was that it was what it was about fun. when you were, you were like, I'm just going to win an Emmy. Like I'm yeah, <laughs> literally. I keep saying this in the series. I continuously just keep saying I, I made this to win an Emmy and people kept coming up to me being like, do you actually want to win an Emmy? And I was like, yeah, like <laughs> how many times do I have to say it? It's very blatant. Um, it's called an Emmy for Megan. I literally thought of it last year when a couple of my friends were nominated for web series performance Emmys. And I was like, um, <laughs> That's okay, thing, right? uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to utilize, uh, I would like to call in every favor I've accumulated over the past few years. And so you haven't seen, I mean, Ted Danson's in it, RuPaul's in it. I mean, you've got- I, <laughs> I truly was like, I'm going to burn every bridge I can just to like get people to do this and I was nominated I did not win I lost to James Corden for best web series so but you had billboards everywhere and such around I yeah. did uh -huh. I I would see the billboards in LA and be like oh my god I made it I'm on a billboard and then remember that I bought them so it wasn't it was like good to you know keep that in check but yeah I I did a ton of publicity in LA which was part of the whole like shtick of it, um, where I bought three billboards, <laughs> which if anyone uh, is interested in getting their own billboards, I know a lot about it. <laughs> a very nice lady at Clear Channel helped me. Um, and I, I got a bunch of lawn signs that like politicians use. <laughs> and one of the people, it, I, I just like bought them online at a random place <laughs> in Texas that prints lawn signs. It's called like cheaplawnsigns.com. <laughs> And I got a Instagram message from someone who works at the printer for the lawn signs when she was doing it. And she was like, we're all rooting for you. <laughs> and I was like, this is amazing. This is a grassroots campaign. Um, so it was a really fun uh, piece of rascally uh, exhibitionism. I've mean, read one article um, about you. I read a lot of articles about you. Um, but you. Uh, but one of the things you said was it's, it's a bit, right? I mean, you're do, you know, there's a piece of you that that's you, you get to I've kind of play, right? Truly lost the, the thread of what the bit is at this point <laughs> as I was. Yeah, it's like the I definitely think when I first started making jokes on Twitter, there was like a character I was uh -huh. playing and it was like I have a very weird picture that is for a long time was like the only picture of me on the internet because I wanted to be sort of, un I didn't want to seem like a real person. Mm -hmm. I wanted to seem like an anonymous weird clown. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and even like the web series I made, like every interview I've done about it was like very much in character. <laughs> um, and the Megan uh, in the web series thinks she's really great at everything, <laughs> which I in real life do not. But uh, it, I, I would say I like playing a heightened version of myself. <laughs> it's really where I feel most comfortable. <laughs> and so, so then you were t like kind of discovered off of that, right? For the, for the yes. Academy Awards first? Yes, that, so okay? um, my first job crazily was the 2011, writing for the 2011 Oscars, which was the Anne Hathaway James Franco Oscars, oh. which I would not trade that uh, first writing job for anything. <laughs> it was very strange, as you may have 
noticed if you watched it. Uh -huh. I did but watch you all it. were like four when it was on, <laughs> right, so right, right. yeah. <laughs> so from there, then you went to Disney. Was that your first riding? Yes. Job so I um, and like, the, if any of you ever moved to LA or anything, it's like I kind of. It was a very stressful first, you know, few years when you move there because you have no idea what's going on. But it's also a very fun time because you have no idea what's going on and it's like exciting to see where all these things lead. So I uh, was looking for a day job. I had started by nannying, which I very much enjoyed and was like, should I just not be a writer and just mm -hmm. be a nanny in like Brentwood, the fancy <laughs> part of LA? Um, and make a lot more money doing that for a probably, while, right? Yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. But I got a day job as an assistant to the showrunners of a Disney Channel show, mm -hmm. which was not, um, I wasn't like, particularly thinking I was gonna like write for a kids show. That wasn't really what I was intending to do, but it was a great job just to get to know television. Mm -hmm. And a piece of advice I give people is like, if they're moving to LA and want to be in television, getting any sort of job in television is a great start mm -hmm. and is obviously extremely competitive. Mm -hmm. But um, so I got hired as the assistant to the showrunners of this new kids show. And how did you get that job? Like how was it? I, had like one of my friend's aunts worked uh -huh. in the show mm -hmm. and they needed a random like mm -hmm. kid who had just moved there basically. Okay. Um, they were looking for a staff writer, which is the you know entry level position of writer. And they like kind of couldn't find anyone who was right for the writer's room. And they knew that I in the end wanted to be a writer mm -hmm. and you know, could read my Twitter, and I had come out with a sample, which was not a kid-friendly 30-minute <laughs> sample or whatever, but they were like, clearly you can write a lot and have, an, uh, like, an ability to make jokes. Mm -hmm. And so hired me uh, from my position as an assistant, which I had been for a little bit, and it was such a great way to learn how a writer's room worked before I got, like, the types of jobs that I really wanted to do. And I felt very lucky that I was able to learn some of the jargon and mm -hmm. all this stuff so I wouldn't embarrass appear, myself as much later. when I uh -huh. yeah started working in sitcoms. So what kind of things, like when you were in that room, what things did you learn that, that you took with you, you know? I mean, I like this is another thing. I didn't go to film school. I barely knew how to write anything. I was very she lucky. Went to Harvard. I mean, come on. I did, but yeah. Jared Kushner went to Harvard. <laughs> Harvard's for idiots. Like, <laughs> Harvard has some of the stupidest people I've ever met. Anyway, I did love going to Harvard. I mostly just like did musical theater there. My mom was like, uh, clearly you've just gone to like summer art summer camp for like four years, which did. I like wrote a lot when I was there, and I think like I definitely used it as a way to like have fun in the arts mm -hmm. and prepare myself for a writing career. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are just like very specific things. Like e I'd never taken a screenwriting class. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what like an act break was. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I luckily was able to sort of learn it on the job. Uh, but yeah, I think there's like technical things, even just like what people do on a set mm -hmm. or Something that I didn't know when I moved out to LA was um, how, so like the credits you see at the beginning of a television show, a lot of those are you know very specific jobs or they're types of writers that have different names that I had no idea that there was this sort of hierarchy in a writer's room. Mm -hmm. Things like that that are very specific to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So like I didn't know any writers growing up. Like my mm -hmm. mom's friends couldn't be like, here's how it works. Um, so yeah, I, I was able to pick up a lot of that stuff, but I think having like a film school background or like even taking classes is very useful. Mm -hmm. Because there's something after you wrote for Ant Farm, right, mm -hmm. on Disney. Um, so how did you land up then? Like, what, what was your pathway then? Because I know you've written for other shows yeah. too, but, but then you eventually ended up Parks and Rec and Michael yeah. Sears kind of domain. So I, and I have nothing, I feel like I sometimes in like interviews and stuff talk too much about like Mike Schur being like an ultimate amazing person and genius, but I'll continue saying it. So Mike created Parks and Rec and The Good Place where I now work and Brooklyn Nine-Nine mm -hmm. and a million other things. And he also is obsessed with Twitter to an extent that he often has to take Twitter breaks because he's just like, I can't 
like it sucks too much time. Sure. Um, which he's currently on a Twitter okay. break. Um, <laughs> but he first got to know about me through Twitter, mm -hmm. um, it, like maybe a year after I was working at the Disney mm -hmm. Channel, mm -hmm. and um, I and we just like had mutual friends at that point. Something I do like about LA, even though it's stressful at sometimes, is like every comedy writer knows each other, which I'm like very antisocial and I don't like running into people I know, but you always do. Uh -huh. um, I guess I shouldn't complain about having too many <laughs> friends. That's a true <laughs> humble brag. But um, the, uh, yeah, so, so Mike has always been really good, I think, of taking chances on new writers from like different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Like he really likes creating a room that's... That's uh, not just tell, like Hollywood, you know, comedy yeah. writers that take it from one room to the other. Yeah, it's not yeah. just Harvard writers. It's <laughs> Harvard writers from Twitter. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, so he found you on that, and then he brought you into an already established room at yes. Parks and Rec. So, so I started writing um, Parks and Rec. Season five was my first year mm -hmm. there. So I was there five, six, and seven the last year. Um, and I was, like, obsessed with Parks and Rec before I wrote for the show, which was a very bizarre experience. And... Like, I remember watching the premiere when I was in college or mm -hmm. whatever, and um, it was very surreal to then go into the environment and work with these people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's... Parks and Rec had, like, the smartest, funniest people, and that, again, really still felt like I was just learning uh -huh. how to do all these things. And something, again, if you guys are looking to become writers... Something that was told to me very early on that I think is very important to remember is that should you be given the opportunity to be in a writer's room, you are not expected to be like the the person who fixes the show immediately. So I was told as a staff writer, and Mike, when he hired me, was like, uh, sort of said, like, you clearly are funny and want to learn this craft and so you're here to, you know, maybe pitch some jokes, but you're not here to necessarily, like, do the meat of the work, which is, like, the really hard story moves and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. You're here to, like, learn so from other he, people and be supportive. You. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I was like, you wouldn't necessarily know that, um, but there's a weird unspoken hierarchy in writers' rooms which are different at every show, which makes it You're an harsh, interesting, yeah. like, social thing to navigate. But, yeah, it's so at Parks and Rec, I was able to just, like, learn so much from other people. And it was a show that, like, everyone was really good friends on mm -hmm. and hung out a ton. And I think that comes across, like, the show itself is a very sweet it is, show yeah. where, like, everyone hangs out at their <laughs> workplace. And uh, you I was... write that experience? Yeah. And I, I was very excited to get to work on such a sweet show. And you were on that for... Three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. Okay. But then the, the good place. So so yeah. Michael sure had, had yeah. worked with you. Yeah. And he had this concept, and they told him. Yes. Like, so um. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Um. So we finished up Parks and Rec. I worked for a year on Silicon Valley, which like I didn't know anything about the tech world, mm -hmm. and it was we did we do a ton we did a ton of research for that show, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting, and was like, oh my god, I can't work in tech ever this is there's so many like weirdos <laughs> weirdos but also just like very superficial people mm -hmm. which is what the show's about but um but the google campus we went to did have like so much free food yeah. i was like i get I why you would here. just work there right. yeah <laughs> anyway so worked there for a year and then mike sure got in touch with a lot of us who worked on parks and mm -hmm. rec and pitched us the idea of the good place mm -hmm. and was like i'm making the show do you want to come like get get the band back together a little bit and I was like this I never would have guessed that something like that would happen and it was like truly an inc I was so happy to so hear is about the it the, that is the gang so back we have together. a lot of writers from Parks and Rec that went and worked on mm -hmm. The Good Place um and I I will say one of the happiest days of my life is I got to see Hamilton in New York, and I am a huge Broadway fan. So I'm not just like one of those fair weather Hamilton fans. I just, <laughs> it was like a great show. I was very excited to see it. And the, like the lights came on and I checked my phone and it was an email from Mike being like, 
hey, do you want to talk about this new show? And oh. I was like, oh my God, this is like truly, <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was one of the best days of my life. Anyway, so the first season of The Good Place, the writers from Parks and Rec were like, Mike, me, Jen Statsky, Joe Mandy, Matt Murray, Aisha Muhar, Alan Yang. It was like a lot mm -hmm. of us, mm -hmm. um, which almost had this like uncanny valley, like it felt so similar to when we were there, but then like some people were there, um, but. And this is the first time you're at the start of the show, yes. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also a very big sci-fi like mm -hmm. genre fan, so it was very exciting to get to work on a show. The, the Good Place, for those of you who haven't seen it, I will not try to give away anything. Also, it's very Although hard we, to explain. Yeah, I, just, I think we may have to talk about it. If you haven't seen it, you should, we're in season three now. You're past the point, right? Yeah. Reveals. Wow, thanks. <laughs> um, no, The Good Place is like a science fiction show that is like very fun because it blends like a ton of jokes. Like we write a lot of jokes for it. It's similar in humor to Parks and Rec or something like that. But it also is a heavily plotted show where we wanted it to be like moving really quickly and it's a type of writing that I'd never done before mm -hmm. where you have to like plan, we plan the whole season in mm -hmm. advance and sometimes even farther than a season. Uh, and Mike has talked about how the first person he pitched The Good Place to was Damon Lindelof mm -hmm. who co-created Lost mm -hmm. and told him like know where the show was gonna go mm -hmm. and also like it's it's kind of amazing we sort of did do like it's not comedy lost but it's not 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 like <laughs> <laughs> has elements of that sort of science fiction thing um but and the, but you guys said you plotted it out right I mean from the yes. get-go and like also, I have to give a shit. The person who directed the pilot of The Good Place and then also directed an episode I wrote in season two and is an executive producer is this guy, Drew Goddard, who I'm a huge horror movie fan. And Drew wrote and directed a movie called Captain in the Woods that uh, I was like obsessed with. Captain in the Woods is was such an amazing surprise for me because I didn't know anything about it going into it. It is a great twisty horror comedy. And um, I when I found out he was directing the pilot, I was like so starstruck. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was like so, it was more than like other celebrities I've ever met. I was like, Drew Goddard is gonna be working here. And he's like the nicest, nerdiest dude. Um, but he's the nicest dude and like one of the top five nerdies. I won't say he's the nerdiest, but um, yeah. So so it was a different, it was like a lot of comedy writers, but we also were trying to make this sci-fi thing, mm -hmm. um, which has been very fun. Well, and you mentioned like the difference with Parks and Rec and, and The Good Place, yeah. right? And you've got the same writing team, right? For the most part. Um, and you have the same executive, you know, director, the same creator. Uh, but you're in one writing room where it's completely plotted out because it has to be. Yes. And the other one is, is run how then? Like the um, so Parks and Rec was also, it, it was run where we would definitely have an idea of an overarching story. And uh, at least for the seasons when I was there, we'd sort of break the season into half a little bit and know like where we were going to hit at the midpoint of the season. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it was like a serialized show, but then you also wanted to have these like little self-contained stories in each episode. So it was, you know, sketched out at the beginning of the season. I would say that what goes into most comedy shows mm -hmm. is that the first few weeks of a writer's room are spent just like generally thinking about where do we want to end the season? Mm -hmm. How do we want to get there? Mm -hmm. Excuse me, and then maybe then you start breaking down like, okay, what are each step of the way? Mm -hmm. And like something like Silicon Valley or Transparent too are mm -hmm. very, they're serialized mm -hmm. too. So you're mm -hmm. telling a cohesive story. I'd say there's like fewer shows now that are just like episodic comedies, mm -hmm. but something like animated shows or like The Simpsons sure, often sure. do that. Um, but again, I, th I think something that I love so much about writing for TV is that you get to like grow alongside with your show or mm -hmm. with viewers and our show 100% is like affected by what's going on in the world. I was saying this to you before the panel but like 
we were talking about whether Parks and Rec would ever be rebooted, which I will not speak uh, about that. But I think that Parks and Rec was very much a show that was like for the Obama era and was like, it was like kind of like unabashed hopefulness yeah, that like mm -hmm. was really sweet and didn't have that much of an edge to it. Mm -hmm. But The Good Place, <laughs> which also talks about The Bad Place, <laughs> which the, the premise of The Good Place is that uh, Eleanor Shellstrap, Kristen Bell, wakes up in the pilot and sees Michael, Ted Danson, who is a kindly older man and is like, welcome Eleanor, you died. Uh, and just, you know, like there's a, a good place and a bad place and you made it to the good place. And Eleanor's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then throughout the episode, it's revealed that she's actually like a really bad person. Well, not really bad. What, what, and pretty mediocre person identity. who <laughs> accidentally seemingly has been placed into heaven. Um, the good place. Uh, but like... What makes a person a good person or bad person is what the show is about. Um, and it is something that like we, the writers, are all obsessed with and I think is very relevant to like politics and to what's going on in the world mm -hmm. is like, how do you be a good person when there's so much bad stuff going on? Mm -hmm. Or is it worth it? Right. Mm -hmm. Or what does that mean outside of things like religion? Because our show is non-religious. It's just like about ethics and in a bubble, what would make someone a good person? And it's what your really motivations hard. are, what your, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also, this is something we talk a lot about on the show, but it like working on a show like this makes you extremely cognizant of the choices you make that are not great. Mm -hmm. And I feel like half of us became vegetarians <laughs> while working on the show, just cause it was like, you go to get, I like ate so much red meat. And then I was like, really do I, could I like pick something else maybe mm -hmm. like, and uh, yeah, we've all just started a, like a group shaming of <laughs> each other at lunch. No, I'm kidding. Well, and, the, and the, he, he, I've heard interviews too with you guys about talk, bring, you bring in people talking about these ethic things. And we have mm -hmm. a really great, we have a few different people we've talked to, but mm -hmm. there's a really great advisor named Todd May, mm -hmm. who having, I, I never studied philosophy in school. I hadn't met a lot of philosophers. Mm -hmm. um, and he is a professor who wrote a really interesting book called Death, which like, look, I looked so cool, like out of the coffee shop, just <laughs> reading a book with a black cover that said Death. Um, but it's a book that is written in a fun colloquial way, but it's like, how do you live a life when you know you're gonna die? This is like what I'm talking about at my comedy writing job, which I love, but is like, I never would have expected that mm -hmm. that's the kind of conversation I'd be having. But Todd is um, an advisor to us and has given us like lectures, but we're all dorks. So we're all like so excited when it's like Todd May Day and he tells us about whatever. Um, and does it feed you? Does it feed your writing and, and, and your thoughts? And, yes, and uh -huh. I, I definitely think like, it is also totally, it's, I was about to say it's totally affected my own writing that I do outside of the show, but then also I just showed you an Emmy for <laughs> Megan, which is like is about truly dilemma? nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's like a fun romp that I made in like a day. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, no, it, it like the, I mean, not to be like, we're doing such important work with the show, because I don't, I think that Rather than that, we're doing work that like we all feel is very important to us. And I now think going forward, I was like, anything I'm gonna write like needs to be about something. Yeah, but I do think even you're writing outside of this, right? Yeah. Like the book, book Science for Her is amazing. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's hilarious, but it has a point to it. It's yeah. very feminist. It's Cosmo in, I, in that. I wrote a book fun. a few years ago called Science for Her, which looks like a Cosmo <laughs> magazine and is the premise, which is satirical, is um, that women's brains are too small to like understand real science textbooks. So I wrote one that was like easily digestible. And there also are, they're loosely inspired by real books that do exist that are like girl math. <laughs> and I was like, I was like a very, I was really into math and science as a kid and saw these books and were like, this is, 
it literally would be like how to find the volume of your handbag. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. It's very complicated. I think this is not the right way to do it though. <laughs> um, but I, I, something about the book that I was also given a piece of advice that I thought was really helpful was I really loved writing prose comedy. I've written it for some venues and like, mm -hmm. I find that to be a fun way to procrastinate on like, Sket or on scripts without like really procrastinating. Mm -hmm. It's just like writing pieces. And uh, I wanted to write a book, but I wasn't sure. I really did not want to write like a memoir, which was kind of like what was it? I was like, I don't remember anything. Like I couldn't write a memoir if I tried. And I was like 25 <laughs> at the time, <laughs> would have been dumb. Um, but someone was like, if you look at your past writing, whether that's like Twitter or prose stuff or scripts, if you read stuff that you have written in the past and you like read it all at once, you will get an idea of what your natural character kind mm -hmm. of is. Oh, and it sounds obvious to be like, yeah, I know what I wanna write, but it wasn't obvious to me. It just, after years of writing stuff every day, I was able to like look back through everything I'd written and look for a commonality. And I saw, oh, I've written a bunch of pieces that are like fake Cosmo uh -huh. and are also like extremely on the nose, like fem feminist satire, uh -huh. where it was like about how dumb girls are or whatever. <laughs> um, and through that sort of like formulated this. but. I think it also like my book and an Emmy for Megan are both like <laughs> messing with like the form of thing. Mm -hmm. I like just sort of like making fake artifacts. But I think I th that's yeah. I think though that you do write like your stuff for the New Yorker too. I think it's, it's you are. I mean everything's satirical, right? And you are really talking about important things, you know. And so it's you have a substance to everything that you write, and and even though you don't have an agenda per se, you, there is an agenda, you know what I mean? There is, yeah. a, there's something you're trying to say No, totally, it. and it's like, it's also, it's easier to think of things when you're like, what are the things I care about in the world and what is what am I obsessed with during the day? Mm -hmm. And then turn it into uh, some sort of comedy. But yeah, it's like the, the good place which takes up most of my mental mm -hmm. energy right now, is a show that's like truly about everything. It's about like the biggest things mm -hmm. you can possibly think of. And I feel like there's been moments in the writer's room that we've been trying to like figure out like, basically like what happens after you die or what is God. And then we have to take a step back and be like, I don't think we're gonna figure this out in like a work day. <laughs> I think like people have been trying for nearly all of humanity to figure this one out. And I don't think we're gonna like figure this out before 5 p.m. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's I my, another uh, piece of advice that I would have would just be like to let yourself like take a step back and be like, what am I obsessed with? And then try to write comedy about right. it. Yeah. <laughs> But that that easy about, thing to do. We yeah. talk about like walking around yeah. the world and like seeing what actually moves you, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what you do think about, what you do obsess about and yeah. stuff and to use those versus trying to be a peer, trying to be clever, yeah. you know, really using what's, what's making you tick, you know, inside. I went to the Chicago Art Institute today, which I thought was like such a beautiful museum and was looking at um, all these plaques where it was like, Monet was trying to figure out the nature of time. And then I was like, I tried to write a tweet today about Donald Trump. <laughs> I was like, I want a plaque that's like <laughs> describing that. But it is like, we're all just trying to do the same thing. I was, I was having this moment of like, all my friends who are writing comedy, even if it's like dumb and bad, are all trying to do the same thing, which is just like, put a definition on something that they're feeling mm -hmm. and trying to like connect with another person. So I'm Monet. That's <laughs> the takeaway. We kind of do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, so when you're writing this and, and you're and you're at the good place and you're writing for an enormous audience, right? Yeah. Um, Wendy was talking about this of like, there are certain jokes that are thrown in and where do you, that some people might get, a lot of people won't. Yeah. I mean, what, when you guys are creating this, you're like, I have to write it for a mass audience, but there's still somebody else I'm talking to in the process, right? The, the amazing thing about The Good Place is I think we made a very niche show that like, so I also was on like a Delta, or I 
American flight or something a while ago. And they played, it was one of the flights where they like just had a TV that was playing for everybody from the ceiling. And they played an episode of The Good Place from season two. And I was laughing and emailing my friends at The Good Place because I was like, if you watched an episode, even the second episode, you would have no idea what was going on. It like moves very quickly. It doesn't make any, it's not a show you can just like casually tune into. And um, it, I, the great thing is, like, we sort of just made the show that we wanted to see, which asks a lot of viewers in that it, like, literally has philosophy lectures in it. Mm -hmm. And also, you have to, like, pay attention to... It can get very complicated. Um, and people really responded to it, which felt so good. And it's, like, I read... I read, like, every tweet people tweet about The Good Place, so know that I'm, like, an insane internet stalker who's just, like, going through the hashtag. And it's just, like, so fun to watch people feel rewarded for careful viewing. Mm -hmm. And I, that's also a thing about TV now in general, which is that TV viewers have gotten so savvy mm -hmm. about, like, how to watch TV and how it is made. And there's so much, like, experimental television mm -hmm. on now that I think you feel like you can take these like either very specific jokes mm -hmm. that are not necessarily for everyone. That being said, I've said this before, but a big part of one of the characters in The Good Place is that he's obsessed with the Jacksonville Jaguars and Blake Bortles <laughs> and just like yells Bortle, yells the word Bortles. And for like months, this was like some of the writers in The Good Place would like just go Bortles. And <laughs> I thought that was a nonsense word or like slang I'd never heard and was too embarrassed to ask. And then it occurred to me that I could just Google it and then was like, oh, it's a real human being who plays on the Jacksonville Jaguars. So there are jokes that even I do not get, <laughs> though now I can like yell Bortles and I sound cool. Um, this was another thing that we were saying, like there's been some weird parallels to the, like the world that our show have has like accidentally come up across. And like one of them is that the Jacksonville Jaguars when we started the show were really bad and then they got good as far <laughs> as I understand this year. And uh, we like wrote a joke about that into the show because we were like, now we can take so advantage of, this, of the strange world. Um, but yeah, we, we just write a lot of very niche jokes and ask a lot of our viewers and uh, if they if they don't get them or like the jokes, then there'll be like another million jokes. Right. So, right, right. <laughs> so one thing about your show too that I know I'm running out of time with you, but um, one of the like your whole first season is set on you know this premise, right? And then it, it immediately shifts to a whole different arc in, in season yes. two, you know. Um, and so just in that philosophy of keeping people reeled in. I mean, yes. Ted Danson, when he turns like that that the episode 13, you yeah. know, and his face all of a sudden it's Terrifying, you know? It is, like, <laughs> singly one of my favorite. Like, even if I didn't work on the show, like, his smile. There's a big twist in episode 13 of the show. And his smile, when it happens, is, like, so perfect. And I was like, <laughs> Ted Danson is also, like, an incredible actor mm -hmm. that is also, he's extremely modest and also, like, will ask a ton of questions of, like, how was that? Was that okay? And I'm like, yeah, it was okay. You were Ted Danson. Like, what am I going to teach you? Like, but he, yeah, he's so precise. He like takes everything so seriously. And you're like, oh, that's what acting is. That's, I've learned a lot for season two of an Emmy. From my head. I was like, oh, you actually thought about the character and what you were saying. That's very important. Yeah. Cool. Before we start to quest Q and A, um, any last thing you want to say to the, the, the room full of writers and want to be exactly where you are, ready for the good place and the Simpsons and everything? Um, I, I think, I just think it's a very, if you, if you are interested in television writing, especially if you're not like a, a cis, hetero, white male, it's a very exciting time. Mean, it's also exciting if you are. You're always going to do fine. But like, <laughs> the, I, I think like even in the past like 10 years that I've been in LA basically, like, there are so many different types of stories being told and there are so many more opportunities for people that like it 
it, not even to be like an optimist, because I'm like a huge pessimist, <laughs> it is a great time to like be moving to LA and trying to do this. So awesome. if you have the uh, opportunity, I would say just like go for it. And awesome. it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Awesome. laughs> Maddie. Hi, sorry, I'm short. Hi, Hi um, my name's Maddie. I'm a MFA screenwriting student. Um, so since this is both like for the good place and like prior shows you've worked on, um, how do you find your uh, brand of humor fits into the show and how it's fit like into the other writers and like into the show and how that varies from other shows you've been yeah. on before? Um, that's a great question. I think like, Sometimes you were lucky enough to work on a show that lines up very similarly with your natural sense of humor, which I would say Parks and Rec and The Good Place are very similar to like the style of humor that I naturally gravitate towards. But um, I've also worked on, like Transparent is a show that's not like full of silly jokes. And um, that was a show where you really just have to like listen to you know the other people there and to the characters that have already been established. And that's just another skill that I also enjoy, which is sort of like mimicking other people's voices. <laughs> yeah. And some people really like that. I like being on staffs of shows and mimicking other people's uh, styles. And some people really don't, and they're just like creators. They just want to make their own stuff, and that's also fine. But it's, it's a fun game. Cool, yeah. thank you. Hi, my name is Angel Quintanilla. Uh, and uh, I'm a huge fan of The Good Place. I like how the third season started. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to ask, I, I've never gone to school for screenwriting or anything like that and um, jumping into the field. Um, what kind of recommendations would you give uh, if someone that hasn't gone to school for stuff like that? Like if, you know. Yeah, um, <laughs> there, I would say like the first way to start out is to consume a lot of media, which is a great, piece of homework is just to like watch a ton of TV and but be very active about it and be like what do I like about this what don't I like about this and be an active viewer that was one of the first things that I was told to start doing is be like okay you loved the Simpsons why did you love the Simpsons and how can you use that in your own writing but there are also a lot of great resources online um, there's a podcast that I really love that my friends run called script notes that is really insider all about screenwriting and they have a ton of like really amazing screenwriters who come on and I think it's like a pretty fun way to get in touch with like they talk really specifically about different types of jobs and tips for writing so that's a fun, like, free resource. Um, but yeah, I think just like being super active about what you like about stuff is a good place to start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Mary Rose. Um, I'm not a screenwriting major. <laughs> um, my question is about uh, so your puns that you wrote for season two. Um, was there a specific pun that you were like really heartbroken got cut or that like got cut for like being too inappropriate with the network or anything? Um, Great question. So I have to also assess. I don't like puns. I'm not proud of this. And that's not like, I'm not like being modest. I like don't think puns are funny. But I do have like a brain disease where I can't stop making them. It doesn't like have a name or anything. And it start. I mean, I like my mom and brother both make puns a ton. It's like something we all have. And I, when I first started at Parks and Rec, I'd like sometimes accidentally make a pun out loud. And then at one point Mike uh, was like, you should just say them. We can decide to hate them. <laughs> and then I started saying them all out loud and it became like the only thing I was known <laughs> for in the writer's room. So uh, there's an episode of, The Good Place has a lot of rotating um, restaurant names and most of them, not all of them, were named by me with my pun <laughs> disease. Um, and I tweeted a list of like a ton of them that did not get it. My favorite one is, it was a lasagna restaurant called Lasagna Come Out Tomorrow, which was, I like a pun that goes across multiple words. Um, but uh, I don't know, I've let them all just like leak out of my brain, um, but they're, there was, I, I didn't, there was one in the opening episode of season three, which is um, 
wheat crumb from a land down under, which I didn't do. <laughs> I want to take credit for it, but I can't. I don't remember who did do it. I think a writer, Cord Jefferson, might have. Um, so I just like want to take credit for leaking my disease into everyone else at the Good Place Writers Room. That wasn't a very good answer. Sorry. <laughs> Leah Slater, I'm a MFA comedy screenwriting Yay. major, which is awesome. Um, I'm a huge fan of yours and your work. I'm just wondering um, if you could talk more about your experience as a female comedy writer. I know you said it's like a great time for us now, but yeah. um, have you ever felt like you've uh, been relied on to maybe like be the female voice or like offer the female perspective and, and how you navigate that um, yeah. in the writer's room? No, that's a great question. I think that... Um, they're all great questions, not to play favorite. Um, <laughs> it is, I think that even my own psychology when I started as a writer, what I found out, like a showrunner, I did not know what that job was before I started writing. A showrunner often is the creator of a show and is like the ultimate boss who is running the writer's room, is making all the final decisions for even like what the clothes are like in, and who directs it and all these things. And when I first started, I was like, there is no way I can be a showrunner. That is like far too hard of a job. And now I was like, oh, I think like women should all be the showrunners. I think like a lot of women writers that I've worked with or just a lot of different types of people are like particularly well suited for the like organizational uh, and administrative roles that a showrunner entails. Um, I do think there's a funny thing that happens in some writers' rooms that if, if there's only like one person who represents a certain like demographic, they, they are relied on to be like the voice of that entire demographic. And there's no way that like one person of a certain gender or race can like represent every single person from that. And it's a lot of pressure and pressure that should not be put on one person, which is an argument for just like having that much more diversity in a writer's room. Um, but I have mostly been like super blessed with the people I've worked with where even if they like don't come from the same background as me, they've been very respectful and have like, I like being that person who's like, we can't say that, or here's why I don't think it's correct, or whatever it is. Um, but like, just for the good place specifically, it's like we have a diverse writers' room and a diverse cast of different types, and like, it's not the main thrust of the show. It just is like we're trying to be representative of the world, and it is fun because it's like we're able to do it in a way that's like positive and not the, it, it's the background of every story, but it's not like the foreground of all of it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Megan. Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Mm -hmm.